All right, what you say we dive back into uh, leadership lessons with General Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, we left off on leadership lesson number 40, know when to keep your mouth shut, and let's move on to number 41. It ain't over till. But first, just a quick uh, little bit of history here. November 1861, April 1862. The Battle of Belmont, his first Civil War action, gives Grant confidence. He uses this personal knowledge of the Confederate commander at Fort Donelson to his advantage and captures 12,000 man garrison defending the fort. Grant's capture from Fort Donelson gives the Union its first major victory and earns him promotion to Major General. The press begins referring to him as Unconditional Surrender Grant. Number 41, It Ain't Over Till. On November 7th, 1861, Grant led troops in battle for the first time in the Civil War when he attacked a Confederate encampment at Belmont, Missouri. After four hours of fierce fighting, his forces entered the Confederate camp. The moment the camp was reached, our men laid down their arms and commenced rummaging the tents to pick up trophies. Some of the high officers were a little better than the privates. They galloped about from one cluster of men to another, and at every halt delivered a short eulogy upon the Union cause and the achievements of the command. All this time, the men we had been engaged with for four hours lay crouched under cover of the riverbank, ready to come up and surrender if summoned to do so. That's a bit of but finding they were not pursued, they worked their way up the river and came up the bank between us and our transports. Here's the lesson. Avoid premature celebrations. They'll lull you into a false sense of security. Manage important projects as if you were running down a hill in front of an avalanche. You can't afford to stop halfway down the hill, look back, and reflect upon how well you've done so far. Also, don't congratulate others until bottom has been struck. Quote unquote. Uh, let's see here. What if I learned from that lesson and reflect on some of my own experiences? Um, yeah, it kind of reminds me back when I was a Marine security guard. Uh, and it was a three year uh, tour between three different posts. And um, it's kind of like the real world Marine Corps, if you're familiar with the MTV show where they put five people in a house or more and kind of let them get at each other's throats. Well, you know, we're a bunch of Marines and we're out at different embassies around the world. And sometimes your small contingents of um, your detachment is smaller. So you might be five, ten people, and uh, you can get on each other's nerves pretty quick. So a uh, whole part of the training is finding out and weeding out those individuals that are, um, how do you say, not great to be around. Um, and so you have a couple different interviews and such to kind of weed those folks out. And some actually got sent home based on their detachment commander's view of whether or not they should go to post. So there's a little bit of a uh, attrition rate, so to speak. Um, now, that doesn't stop um, once you get out to post either. Uh, there's, you know, you're kind of a poster child for the Marine Corps, and you're representing um, the branch as a whole out there in front of dignitaries and, um, you know, sometimes the president. Uh, I've even stood security for the Secretary of State, Conley's of Rice. Um, so you meet all kinds of people, uh, all the way up to Peter Pace, four-star general, Secretary of Defense. Um, Joint Chief Secretary. Um, so you need to be a professional. Uh, but that is to say, um, you can get removed for really dumb things. And there are a lot of uh, what you might call restrictions. So it kind of feels like a prison to a certain extent with all the rules you have to follow. But they're there for a reason. And you elected to do the job. So you need to follow them. And uh, a lot of times I saw a lot of first posters kind of uh, getting a little cocky and thinking they were... Uh, all there was, you know, the Marine Corps kind of uh, wouldn't exist without them, and a lot of them went home, uh, not only during their first post, but on their second. I remember my third post, which is a particularly um, troublesome detachment, uh, mostly because of leadership, and then trickling its way down to a lot of first posters who had no idea what the program was really like outside of that. And um, a lot of them had no idea that uh, it was different out there and that if they kept up with their unprofessionalism, uh, they were going to be gone, and some of them were. So, um, unfortunate, but uh, yeah. So, I don't know if that really relates, but it ain't over till it's over. Well, you know, 
if it's your first post and you're acting a fool, you got two years ahead of you. And so that's why a lot of us third posters would just cloister up in our room and, and wait it out because we were short timing it and we weren't going to let some knuckleheads screw up the rest of our tour and get us kicked off after we'd already put in two and a half, you know, close to three years. So, um, oh, that's what I take from that leadership lesson. All right, let's move on. Be willing to pull the plug. Number 42. At Belmont, the Union celebration was short-lived. The men we had driven over the bank were seen in line up the river between us and our transports. The alarm, surrounded, was given. At first, some of the officers seemed to think that to be surrounded was to be placed in a hopeless position, where there was nothing to do but surrender. But when I announced that we had cut our way, and could cut our way out just as well, it seemed a new revelation to the officers and the soldiers. Later in the war, when Sherman's army was marching through Georgia, Lincoln sought assurances from Grant that Sherman would not be cut off and surrounded. I heard afterwards of Mr. Lincoln's saying to those who would inquire of him as to what he thought about the safety of Sherman's army. That Sherman was all right. Grant says they are safe, and with such a general, if they cannot get out of where they want to, they can crawl back by the hole they went in at. And here's the lesson. You will usually be able to extricate yourself from even the worst messes if you are willing to back out, but not if you insist on stubbornly pushing forward. Organizations that try to implement a poorly designed or tested system and stick with it because they lack the courage to admit that the implementation was premature can dig themselves in so deep a hole that when they finally do admit their mistake, the cost of backing out is enormous. So I did some reflection on this, and uh, while I was in uh, Iraq, the OIF-2, um, in a combat zone, I wasn't necessarily charging up pills with a rifle and bayonet affixed. Uh, I was a heavy equipment operator uh, during that time, and we were uh, assigned to the uh, Al Takadam Air Base, which is... Um, uh, this was like seven or eight miles west of Fallujah and uh, maybe like 20 away from Baghdad, something like that. And we were up on this little plateau overlooking this lake and they had put in an airfield right there. Um, and so basically the Iraqis had blown up the uh, the aircraft that they had and they'd kind of trying to um, what you call it, blow up the runways too with uh, the meager amount of ammunition that, or munitions that they had. Well, I say meager, there was a lot actually. I just don't think they had time to really do a really uh, thorough job in that respect. In any event, on the, uh, I think it was the west side of the airfield, um, they had blown up a lot of their planes and bombers and such. And so you had a lot of aircraft that was just blown wings and um, blown apart fuselages. And um, we had been doing a pretty good job of uh, building up berms and uh, taking all the challenges that we had ahead of us uh, through the heavy equipment arm to... Um, kind of dress up the base when we took it over. And um, at one point, they wanted to, uh, what you call, dress up that west side of the uh, airfield. Um, a bunch of taxiways, really, and a bunch of fingers, uh, like kind of, can uh, not canyons, but uh, they had a lot of fingers and, um, what do you call, uh, crevasses and such that uh, they would kind of trail, uh, the roads would trail into and stuff, and they'd blow up their planes and stuff so that you couldn't use those uh, so-called taxiways. And uh, our warrant officer, I guess they asked him if he'd be willing to, or if he'd be able, rather, to um, clear all that off. And uh, unfortunately, um, I, I, I thought we were pretty shoestring already. You know, most of our uh, operators were already tasked out with the daily operations of uh, not only our unit, but the things we would farm out to other, other units to do. But he decided uh, we'd put mechanics in the seat. And they'd go in, and they could do just as well as the operators, and uh, they could clean up all the aircraft stuff. And uh, they got a couple pieces of gear on loan from other units, and um, the rest of us operators just maintained what we were doing normally, delivering the pallets of water or unloading trucks or taking uh, other blown-up pieces of aircraft and such and putting it in dump trucks and them taking it over to the to the dump. But... Um, I wasn't over on that west side when things went down, but um, we lost a bunch of pieces of gear just because um, people were lifting up uh, like aircraft wings. They thought they could just go in with an extended boom forklift and lift up these gigantic aircraft wings, which were too heavy for the piece of equipment. 
and then the horse head where like the boom comes out and the forks are kind of attached there's like a little knuckle right there and there was like two or three pieces of equipment where that knuckle actually bent i don't see it it's actually bent and so the forks would be down and it would like the piece of gear was deadlined you'd have to send it back to the states to fix it um so each time one of those pieces of gear would go down, that's one less piece of gear that we have. And then there's all these sharp and tiny pieces of metal. And we went through all sorts of tires, all these heavy equipment tires that we just didn't have backups for, or the few backups that we had, we ended up using. And then those would get blown out too. And so we had like five to six different, um, uh, no exaggeration, five to six different uh, front end loaders that were deadlined just because they didn't have tires to run on them. And so you'd put in a work order for a tire, but it would take like sometimes uh, three three weeks to a month to get those tires in because they had to ship them in through, uh, um, you know, on a ship and then bring them in through enemy occupied roads. And um, a lot of that stuff couldn't be flown in. So, uh, but anyway, you got you to gotta be willing to pull the plug or admit that, hey, we're already short tasks and that's something we can't do even if it's gonna look good on my uh, my suit jacket later, right? I don't know if that was what the motivation was of that uh, chief warrant officer at the time. It very well could have been that someone told him, hey, you're gonna do this regardless. And he could have very well said, we're gonna lose equipment. But the person ahead of him said, I don't care, get it done and don't let that happen. But what was funny was uh, those of us that uh, thought it was a bad idea, every time a mechanic would come in having broken a piece of gear, uh, we kind of look at them and go, oh, not, not such a great, because uh, they, they always like to belabor us when a piece of gear got broken or something, basically saying, hey, we could do better than you. And then when it actually got put to them, they started breaking equipment left and right. Um, and in a lot of cases, I don't think it was necessarily their fault. I actually had to go in with a front end loader and help another front end loader out of a precarious situation because all the lug nuts on the rear tires sheared off on both wheels. I don't know how that happens, but it was basically like any, anytime a mechanic sat in the, in the cockpit, um, sat in the chair and operated, the piece of equipment would break. Uh, it was just like a bad omen. And so I had to go in there and uh, lift up the ass end of this front end loader and, and drive it out of this precarious uh, situation, uh, which was actually kind of impressive because I had no idea how to do it, but uh, we got it done. And uh, I made some magic behind the stick on occasion. Um, so yeah, I, well, that's what I take from that leadership lesson. So let's move on to number 43, know your competition. Grant believed one of the great advantages he derived from his years at West Point in the Mexican War experience was having been brought into personal contact with many of the men he would both serve with and oppose during the Civil War. The acquaintance thus formed was of immense service to me in the War of the Rebellion. I meant what I learned of the characters of those to whom I was afterwards opposed. I do not pretend to say that all movements, or even many of them, were made with special reference to the characteristics of the commander against whom they were directed. But my appreciation of my enemies was certainly affected by this knowledge. In February 1862, Grant captured Fort Donelson, Tennessee, giving the Union its first major victory. Grant chose to move against a larger and entrenched enemy force without waiting for reinforcements because he had known the Confederate commander, General Gideon Pillow, in Mexico, and judged that with any force, no matter how small, I could march up to within gunshot of any entrenchments he was given to hold. After Fort Donelson surrendered, Grant had a friendly conversation with his old friend, Confederate General Simon Buckner. He said to me that if he had been in command, I would not have given up to Donaldson as easily as I did. I told him that if he had been in command, I should not have tried in the way I did. And here's the lesson. Study your competition, if at all possible. Get to know them personally. The most valuable lessons of all are those learned from and about your competitors. And so, uh, giving thought to this particular uh, lesson, um, and I hate to think about this, but uh, I often saw my uh, superiors as enemies, uh, specifically the, the bad leadership. And, you know, I know you're probably not supposed to think of it that way, but in a lot of cases they were, as I mentioned previously, uh, what was causing a lot of the issues 
in, say, the detachment. And that's a particularly great example, that particular detachment. Um, I had actually been on post, and I asked the uh, gunnery sergeant that was in charge of the detachment. So I was set to leave in six months, so I wanted to get all my uh, terminal leave figured out. And terminal leave is if you have a bunch of leave saved up, you can take that time and kind of get out of the Marine Corps early, if you like. And I wanted to have all my ducks in a row so that I could take those 30 days or however it was and kind of take that off my uh, exit of service date. And uh, when I went to him and spoke to him about it, he said, oh, that's not for you to worry about. I'll handle all that. And I really didn't trust him. Uh, so <laughs> I was like, okay, roger that. And then I, as soon as I did that, I went into the other room and I picked up the phone. I called the company and I got a hold of another sergeant. And I says, hey, so-and-so... Um, I just wanted to uh, get my terminal leave papers going. He goes, well, why are you calling me? I go, uh, because I want to get my terminal leave papers going. He goes, well, that's for your detachment commander to handle. Why are you calling me? And I said, again, I just want to be proactive. Because I knew in the back of my head, like, and I didn't want to say to him, he ain't going to do it. I know this from past experience based on everything he's been doing and everything he cares about. And um, he goes, well, don't call me again. He hung up, and you give it like a minute count. And I was being called into the office. And what did I just tell you? I told you I was going to take care of you. Roger that. Didn't believe it for a second. And fast forward to I'm getting out of that detachment. And guess what? That guy didn't file any paperwork. And so I had to end up selling all my leave back, which gets taxed at a high rate. And you basically get a month's pay. And so I got screwed. So you got to know your competition. I did in that case. I did what I thought was prudent. Um, it just didn't work out because, you know, I wasn't the person in the position of being able to handle those particular situations or those decisions, rather. I suppose I could have stayed on them a little bit harder, but um, I don't know. What do you do? You're kind of you stuck, like I said. Anyway, that's what I thought of with that one. Let's move on to number 44, Confronting Disaster. The day before the Confederates at Fort Donelson surrendered, they attacked in a desperate attempt to break through Grant's lines. Grant, who was away at the time of the attack, was informed that some of his forces, that some of his forces rather, were scattered and in full retreat. He hurried to the scene of the disaster. I saw the man standing in knots, taken in the most excited manner. No officers seemed to be giving any directions. I directed Colonel Joseph Webster to ride with me and call out to the men as we passed. Fill your cartridge boxes quick and get to the line. The enemy is trying to escape and he must not be permitted, be permitted to do so. This acted like a charm. The men only wanted someone to give them a command. And here's the lesson. When confronted with disaster, size up the situation as quickly as possible. Determine what needs to be done, then let all those affected know what you think about the problem, know what you think the problem is, and what you intend to do about it. Above all, remain calm. Calmness in the face of disaster inspires confidence. So giving some thought to this, I had a little bit more trouble, because I wasn't often in a position where I was directing Marines, telling them what to do. But um in one case in boot camp that I could recall during the crucible, which is like the big test of, of wills, and um, you go through a bunch of different obstacle courses and challenges ahead of you, um, you kind of get grouped up into a squad of, I think it was, say, you know, 20 recruits, maybe. And in this particular instance, we had like a 12 to 15 foot wall ahead of us. And the only challenge was to get everybody over that wall in the time limit. Yeah, you know, let's say it was 10 minutes, right? And we all had uh, rifles slung and full, uh, you know, mock full combat gear. And nobody knew what to do. And uh, at a certain point, um, I just kind of was like, you know what, whatever. Just I started helping boost people up, kind of taking charge. You need to do this, you need to do that, blah, blah, blah. And, and we got everybody up that and over that wall. But when the time came, like a minute left, I was the only one left that couldn't get over that wall. Tried to uh, drop a rifle down and grab onto the buttstock and pull me up it just didn't work out so ultimately we failed but i figured i'd take the sacrifice and get everybody up over that um obviously there was no threat other than time of practice but um you know sometimes i guess you gotta sacrifice things and get it done right that's so that was the idea i had from that a story to take from that let's move on to number 45 
provide the tools. One reason for the initial success of the Confederate attack was that General John McClernand's division had run out of ammunition. His men had stood up gallantly until the ammunition in their cartridge boxes ran out. There was an abundance of ammunition nearby laying on the ground in boxes, but at this stage of the war it was not at all of our commanders of regiments, brigades, or even divisions who had been educated up to the point of seeing that their men were constantly supplied with ammunition during an engagement. So here's the lesson. You can't expect your people to get the job done if you don't see to it that they have the tools that they need to do it. And that just uh, leads me to think about, say, like the war, the World War II with Russia. You know, they didn't have enough uh, weapons to supply all their soldiers. So they would assign two or three people to one weapon. And then when one person would get shot, the next guy would grab it, use it until he got shot. And then another person would go and grab that. But they had the people to throw at that, unfortunately. So that kind of made up for that. Um, and again, this is just kind of, it dovetails back into uh, what I was talking about with Iraq and all the gear. Um, you got you to make sure you have the gear to use and not put it in a situation where it's going to get busted or broken or um, just thrown deadline so you can't use it because of the tires or maybe you're out of hydraulic fluid. But so now you got a bunch of idle Marines sitting around, can't do anything except maybe fill sandbags and that ain't good for morale, right? <laughs> so in any event, that has been Cigars, Whiskey, and Winning Leadership Lessons from a General Ulysses S. Grant and just a few of my military stories uh, to, I don't know, provide some color commentary for as much. All right, let's get back to it and we'll talk about it on the next time. All right.